Welcome back. It is your Feel Good Breakfast Show, Expresso on S3. We were talking all things current affairs today, and this is no different. Water and Sanitation Minister Senzo Mkunu briefed media last week on the latest interventions made by the department and the city of Tswane to deal with the cholera outbreak in Hamanskral. Now, the city and the department agreed to jointly fund the project to upgrade and fix the water supply system in Hamanskral. Now, here to give us the latest update about the situation and also to talk more about the spread of cholera in, uh, into Mpumalanga is Professor Anthony Turton. Good morning, Professor. Good morning to you and the listeners. Thank you for joining us this morning because I think a lot of people are waiting for an update. It is reported that this upgraded project will cost around 4 billion rand and can take about three years if all goes to plan. What are the upgrades that will have to take place? And surely, you know, in the three years, is, is it too long because what's happening currently in the meantime? Yes, uh, this is a, a complex issue and uh, just throwing money at it is not necessarily going to solve it. So um, I'm personally of the opinion that until such time as we do what is known in engineering terms as a root cause analysis, mm. uh, we, uh, we won't know exactly what needs to be fixed. Therefore, we can throw many billions of rand at it and we're not necessarily going to fix it. That creates a sense of false hope. And I use as an example the, uh, what happened in the Mfuleni uh, wastewater treatment failure case a couple of years ago, about 2017, around about there, where uh, a, a huge sewage works failed exactly like the Royval has, has done in the case of the Mohammed's Kral. Uh, they threw one billion rand at it, uh, couldn't fix it up. They then deployed the army, threw another billion rand at it. The army couldn't fix it up. They then appointed uh, Arvat, Eastrand Water Care Company, another billion rand. So three billion rand later, still haven't fixed it up. So I am personally of the opinion that Treasury should not release that money until such time as a root cause analysis is done, because uh, the root cause analysis tells the engineers exactly what needs to be fixed, and therefore it, uh, it redirects the flow of money to the appropriate problem. Having said that, the cholera issue is very serious in South Africa. It was mentioned in the 2019 Water and Sanitation Master, master Plan, not cholera per se, but in, the, in that master plan. Uh, it acknowledged that approximately 50% of our water treatment plant uh, is in a critical, critical uh, uh, or damaged uh, condition, and uh, therefore the loss of public confidence in this whole thing is very, very high. We need to restore confidence uh, uh, as much as we need to actually fix the infrastructure, and if, if by their own admission half of the water treatment plant in the country is in a critical condition, then, then just throwing a, a six billion or whatever, four billion rand mm. at one particular wastewater works, uh, the, the Royal Wastewater Works, is not going to make a national uh, a difference. We've got to be smart with what we do, and we've got to uh, go out of our way to restore public trust and confidence. You are right, Professor. We do need to restore public trust and also do something immediately because looking at the numbers, cholera cases have been recorded in Mpumalanga as well as at least one person dying. Now, Professor, how likely is it to spread further and what can be done to stop that? I mean, I mean right now, what can we do? Well, you know, we, we are currently living uh, globally through what is known as the seventh cholera pandemic. So it's actually a global issue. And this thing has been a persistent one, unlike, uh, unlike the COVID pandemic, which you know, lasted uh, two years or so. The cholera pandemic has lasted since the 1960s, so it's quite a, quite a persistent one. And what's interesting, if you look at that, uh, uh, the data from that pandemic, is it started out initially uh, uh, in Indonesia, and then spread throughout the world uh, via USSR, Russia, Russia etc., into Europe, uh, then into Africa. But uh, it, it, it brought about a strain called the El Tor strain. And that El Tor strain seems to be persistent. And initially, uh, it was found that uh, the, the mortality rate was, was in excess of 40%. So 40% so of all people that got it actually died at that point in time. But now through intervention, uh, uh, through the application of protocols uh, that are now being applied all over the world, uh, the, 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 the mortality rate is down to 3%. So in other words, there is still mortality associated with it, but it is a manageable thing. So the important thing uh, from this is that when anyone gets sick, they, they must report to uh, professionally trained medical staff as soon as possible. This doesn't get any better any quicker. 
Uh, you, you must uh, report to, uh, to, to a trained medical professional, and the trained medical professional then applies the protocols that have been developed you know, through the seventh uh, uh, pandemic. And uh, if they do that, then, the, then, the, then the, they've got a 97% chance of survival, which is a, a fairly good chance of survival, but it still shows that this is potentially a deadly uh, a, a disease, and uh, you know, we must not take it uh, flippantly at all. I hear you, Professor, and it's definitely something that needs to, to be addressed as seriously and as quickly as possible. Professor, why is it so difficult to pinpoint the, the, the source of the outbreak of cholera? Well, well, part of it is that uh, uh, I think there's a significant amount of denialism in the system. You know, people don't want to accept responsibility. Uh, for, for what's going on. It's also, uh, you, you want to have a forensic capability to actually look at the strain. We do have a very, very uh, sophisticated uh, medical health system in, in the NICD. They, they, they do have the capability. I don't know if they are involved at this point in time. I would like to think that they are because they've got the ability to actually look at the specific strain, uh, to look at the genome that they're dealing with to see if it is in fact this LTOR uh, variant or not. And uh, you know, so they are very important uh, uh, partners in the process. But uh, but ultimately, you know, part of the problem is that um, we we don't we don't know if it's come through the drinking water system. Uh, indications are it's not through the drinking water system at this stage. But indications are that where it has come through, it, it's come through probably in the in tanker systems. So we we, we water is delivered by tankers. Uh, there's a logical pathway there, but we don't know for certain. Okay. Of course, the other aspect of this is because uh, all of our rivers are so contaminated with sewage, uh, uh, we, can, we can safely say that almost as close to 100% of our rivers as we, as we can measure are, are contaminated with sewage. And part of the problem now is if, if water is taken out of the river for irrigation of crops, for example, let's just say lettuces or something like that, and then those lettuces aren't washed properly, that is one of the pathways of contamination. So, in other words, it can, you know, it can be very, very uh, diffuse throughout society, and that makes it also very difficult to actually pinpoint the exact so-called ground zero. I hear you, Professor. Now, I know you mentioned earlier cholera isn't normally a deadly disease through, you know, interventions. They've brought the mortality rate down quite significantly. But what contributes to Hammanskral being, we're putting the spotlight on them, having such a high rate at the moment? Well, as far as I'm aware, there are various forensic investigations currently underway there, and I don't want to preempt or get ahead of any of those investigations. But what I can say is that we know that the Royval Wastewater Treatment Works has been in a very bad state of, of repair for some time. We also know there's been a lot of corruption uh, at the Royval uh, uh, plant. Uh, there's a forensic trail that goes back to 2001 uh, of, of internal corruption, and that is currently under investigation. Um, so uh, the Royval being a very, very big plant on the one hand and being riddled with corruption on the other hand, uh, indications are that there was... Uh, the, the, the incorrect dis discharge of sludge. Sludge is the solid material that comes out of the sewage after it's been processed. And the sludge handling facility had failed. Okay. Uh, uh, I was appointed to a team in 20, uh, 2015. And uh, or, or, at that point in time already, uh, the sludge handling facility had been upgraded and had failed yet again. And what they were then just doing was they were discharging masses of, flood, uh, of sludge. I'm talking now about thousands of tons of sludge. They were simply discharging into a wetland next to a river. And that sludge never dries up. It's like a jelly material. It never dries up and uh, just stays in the, in the soil for a long, long time. And they, they had tractors that were actually sitting down into their axles. You know, literally, uh, because it's so slippery, the sludge, uh, they, these tractors were just, just sort of uh, sp had their wheels spinning uh, in this muddy material. And, and now that's on the banks of a river. So if anyone has been drawing water from that river, or more importantly, if a tanker operator has taken water from the river rather than from a municipal standpipe, which is what they're supposed to do. But they, but, but we know from uh, cases in KZN that they, that they bypass the system and they go to the fill up in the river rather than at the standpipe because they get paid on each delivery that they make. And if there's a long queue at the standpipe, then they, they, they can't get paid as much as they feel they should get paid and they then bypass the system. So this is the logical, the logical place to look doesn't mean to say that they've actually proven that that is the case yet. They're still you know, looking at that. But we've got to apply our minds. And in the, in the meantime, we've got to apply what is not scientifically as, this, as the uh, precautionary principle. 
the precautionary principle tells us that in the absence of any more robust knowledge to the contrary, we must assume the worst and act accordingly. So, so while it has not yet been proven that it is the tankers, we must assume that it probably is, uh, and, and we must take uh, the precautions. And of course, that implies we must always use clean, sterile uh, water storage facilities. So buckets or whatever you're going to store water in, if you have to store water, uh, a, a, lot of the, a lot of our population has to store water like that. Make sure that that is clean. Uh, make sure uh, you, know, you, you practice basic hygiene, washing of hands, uh, washing of food, prepare, preparation of food uh, using clean water is very, very important. That is probably one of the single most important aspects of this whole thing, the preparation of food, washing of things like lettuce and you know things like vegetables uh, that are eaten, uh, consumed, uncooked. And that's the important thing. Thank you, Professor. And thank you so much for shedding light and giving us more insight into what's happening. We really appreciate your time. A pleasure. Thank you very much. There we go. Water expert and professor at the University of Free State, Professor Anthony Turton, joining us this morning on your Feel Good Breakfast Show.